Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture seven. Um, this lecture is going to be a little bit on the shorter side. It's about section 12 from the textbook, which just covers a few extra facts about limb sup and limb inf, which will be useful later on. Uh, in the first part here, we're going to prove a theorem uh, about what happens when you multiply two sequences where one of the sequences is convergent. Um, what happens to the limb sup? Uh, and actually, you know, obviously, as usual, uh, you know, you could state the same theorem about limb inf and the proof would be basically the same, except, uh, you know, you'd have to flip some stuff around. But so the first thing I want to make clear is that um, limb sup and limb inf in general, do not respect operations like um, addition or multiplication, okay? <clears throat> so what I mean is that if you take two sequences and add them together, the limb sup of the result will not be the sum of the limb subs of the two sequences themselves are the same thing for multiplication. Um, in general, that's not going to happen. This is because of interference. So for example, You know, we could add, we could take two sequences, like we could take uh, negative one to the n or negative one to the n plus one and add them together, right? These two sequences are sort of out of phase with each other in a sense. And so when you add them, they just cancel each other out. Of course, the limb sup here is one, the limb sup here is one, right? So if, you know, naively, if you didn't think very hard about this, you might expect that the limb sup of the, um, the resulting sequence would be two, right? But it's actually zero. Okay? And that's because these sequences are basically interfering with each other. Uh, so what can we say in general? Well, he, we have one theorem here. So let's move on to this uh, theorem now. All right, sorry, I had to uh, make an edit because the uh, whiteboard was acting up. Uh, but so now we can um, state our theorem about uh, multiplying two sequences where one of them is convergent, okay? Of course, we know that if we multiply two convergent sequences, then the result just converges anyway. So the limb subs are perfectly well behaved in that case. But uh, in this case, we'll be interested in when one of the sequences is not required to be convergent. So here's the theorem statement. This is 12.1. So if Sn converges to a positive number s and tn is any sequence then uh, the limb sup of sn tn is s times the limb sub of tn. Okay, so um, this uh, this theorem shouldn't be overly surprising considering the previous discussion because basically, if a sequence is required to converge to some number, then um, you know then that kind of forces it to be. It forces it not to be able to interfere 
with whatever might be happening with Tn, right? If Tn is oscillating or something, or, or just moving around chaotically with some uh, fixed amplitude that doesn't approach zero, then because S has to approach basically a constant, it can't uh, interfere with that you know, in the long run, basically, okay? So uh, the way, the sort of strategy for proving this is to establish two inequalities, okay? So, show that, uh, you know, well, let me write it this way. Um, we're gonna show the left-hand side is greater than or equal to the right-hand side, and the left-hand side is less than or equal to the right-hand side. Another classic strategy. And um, it actually turns out that the second part of this basically follows from the first part, which is kind of um, counterintuitive. So I'll get to that uh, when, when we get there. But so let's just focus on this first part here. Um, so, so let's see, let's say, okay. So let's focus on one. So there are different cases to consider since we haven't said anything about uh, Tn, uh, there, the, we have to consider uh, whether limb sub of Tn might be infinity or um, negative infinity. I think they call beta be, yeah, okay. So they set beta to be the limb sub of Tn. Uh, and it's just that, you know, because with infinities, you kind of always have to break into cases just because the, uh, the structure of the arguments is slightly different, right? So um, let's say beta is, uh, I think they handle the finite case. Yeah, finite first, okay. So um, basically the goal here will be to, um, oh right, yeah. So we can show that, uh, that this, limb sup is greater than or equal to this side. If we show, remember that the limb sup of any sequence is the greatest um, subsequential limit, right? So if we can show that the right-hand side, so we're gonna show that the right-hand side is a subsequential limit of SNTN, oops. Uh, because if we show the right-hand side is a subsequential limit, then the left-hand side has to be bigger because that's the left-hand side is the biggest subsequential limit, right? So um, how do we do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we know there exists a subsequence of Sn converging to S, right? Well, actually rather, Tn, sorry, a subsequence of Tn converging to beta. A subsequence of Tn with, oops, Tnk converging as k goes to infinity to beta, right? This is from a previous theorem. Uh, last, in the previous lecture, we showed that um, there's always a subsequence converging to the limb sub, right? Remember, it's the biggest subsequential limit, but it is a subsequential limit. So we can find this uh, subsequence of Tn, then uh, Snk, uh, well, let's just say, right? So if you take the same subsequence of Sn, right? So Snk converges as k approaches infinity, that has to converge to S because the overall sequence Sn converges to S, right? So then Snk, Tnk converges as k goes to infinity to, um, to um, S beta, right? And 
that's exactly what we wanted to show, right? SNK, TNK, so SNK, TNK is the desired subsequence of SN, TN, right? So we found that S beta is a subsequential limit of SN, TN, which is what we wanted, okay? So uh, that shows that the left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side when beta is finite, okay? Now I'm gonna erase this. Okay, so now let's deal with the case where um, beta is infinity. Right, then we wanna show that um, the limb sub of SN TN is also infinite, right? So to do that, we can just find a subsequence of SN TN, which goes to infinity, and that will be sufficient. So it's basically the same argument as the previous part, just now, you know, accounting for the limit being infinity. So we'll find, so um, we'll find subsequence of SNTN uh, diverging to infinity, okay? So if lim sup of TN is infinity, we know there exists a subsequence of TN going to infinity. So, um, well, we know there exists TNK uh, diverging to infinity. So um, SNK, TNK, again, goes to infinity as K goes to infinity um, because SNK goes to S, which is finite, right? <clears throat> So it's the same, it's the exact same logic basically. So, um, this is the desired subsequence. We've shown that infinity occurs as a subsequential limit of SNTN. So then again, that shows that the limb sub of SNTN has to be at least infinity, which means that it actually equals infinity, right? Uh, okay, so let me, okay, so now let's say beta is negative infinity. Uh, I think what the book writes here is like maybe slightly confusing. Uh, they're just using the fact that like, okay, so then the right hand side is uh, negative infinity in the, in the uh, inequality we're looking at, right? Uh, Oh, I guess they actually number this with like uh, an Arabic one. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. But um, so uh, they just say that because the right-hand side is negative infinity, the inequality has to hold. So then one holds because anything is greater than or equal to negative infinity. Right, that's actually their logic there. <laughs> so uh, it's just kind of trivial. Uh, okay, so now that we've, so we've basically finished proving one, okay? So I'm gonna just erase this now. Now we're gonna talk about two. Uh, and so let's see, so one has been established. Two, I don't know. So for two, they use kind of a trick here, okay? And it basically, philosophically, it boils down to this fact. Between SNTN and TN, um, we don't, there, it's not well-defined which of these two sequences is actually a product of two sequences, right? Like as it's written, obviously, SNTN looks like a product and TN just looks like a normal sequence, but, we can write 
uh, Tn as a product, right, of one over Sn times Sn Tn. And if we just think of Sn Tn as like its own sort of atomic, you know, unitary sequence, it's just a sequence, right? Even though we've written it as a product, it still is just like its own sequence. Then this is like writing Tn as a product of two sequences, basically, right? Uh, so then actually we can basically apply the logic. If we divide by S on both sides, then we can just apply the logic we had previously to show that, um, that uh, so we'll show uh, that lim sup of one over Sn, or rather not that we'll show, but we'll use, since it basically is just, uh, you know, it's because of the previous inequality that we established. So one over Sn and then Sn Tn is greater than or equal to one over S times the lim sup of Sn Tn, right? Because look, now this is in the same form as this inequality, as the, the previous inequality that we established, right? Here on the left side, we have a product of two sequences. And on the right side, we have the limit of one of those two sequences multiplied by the lim sup of the other sequence, okay? So um, this is one for the sequences um, one over Sn and Sn Tn. So basically one over Sn plays the role of Sn here and Sn Tn plays the role of Tn here, okay? Uh, so this inequality is just true by the same logic that we used to prove the first inequality, okay? Um, one technical note here is that like we haven't stipulated that one over Sn or that Sn is non-zero for every value of N, right? And it might not be like some of the first couple terms of Sn might be zero, but because the limit of Sn is positive, right? Then of course one over S exists. And that also means like we've seen before that um, Sn itself has to be positive for all values of N after a certain point basically. So by ignoring the first part of the sequence Sn, we can assume that basically all of these numbers are well-defined uh, because ignoring the first part of a sequence doesn't affect what the lim sup is, right? That's the sort of the beauty of these definitions that we've built up. So um, just to make this totally clear now, uh, so uh, this is true by one, right, is what I'm saying. This inequality we know is true because we already proved it for arbitrary pairs of sequences, right? So then this means if we multiply by S on both sides, right, S limbs up, and if we just simplify the expression in here, one over Sn times Sn Tn is just equal to Tn, right? Uh, so then we get limb sub Sn. Tn. So that's, that's what we were trying to show. That's the inequality too. And so I know it's like a little bit, you know, trippy that we could use the first inequality to actually prove the second one, but it does happen sometimes. Um, all right. So that's it for this part. Uh, I'll see you in the next one.